we've been going th- through Luke, and one of, what we've been doing is we've been kind of looking at Jesus and all that he has done throughout the gospel of Luke. And, you know, in this passage that we're going to get into this morning, we're going to see another interaction about the Pharisees. But before we go there, I want to talk about going to Boston. Because one of the things I love about Concord is, um, one, it is not Boston, um, but it is close to Boston, because I love the city. It's a great city with an unfortunate sports teams. And, um, and it, you know, there's just so much history. It's walkable. It's, for the most part, clean. There's lots of good food. I love being close to Boston. About uh, once every couple of months, Nicole and I make a trip um, to visit our friends in East Boston. And on one of those trips in particular, we were driving down the road and we were driving down 93 and we're getting ready to cross the Zakem Bridge and we need to get off of exit, I think it's 17 there, which is like you get over the Zakem, there's an exit coming on, you have to get all the way over and then go into um, the Callahan Tunnels over to East Boston. Well, I am notorious for kind of settling into the ride, as it were, and you know, like I'm pointing out windmills to Gavin as we're driving, I'm looking at the cranes that are going on, um, that are building all sorts of things, and just admiring the day into the city, and I drove right past my exit, and it added 40 minutes onto the trip. Because I've learned that when you, that though Boston is an amazing city with an unfortunate sports team, it also has spaghetti for roads. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not watching where you're going, if you're just on cruise, you're gonna miss a turn. And that is going to cost you time, lots of time. Well, what's true for driving in the city of Boston is true for life as well. If you aren't paying attention to where you're going, if you're just kind of coasting in your life, your natural tendency is not going to be to drift towards Jesus. It will be to coast right past him. And so this morning, we're going to jump into a text where we're going to look at intentionality about following Jesus. And we're going to see that you can either be a Pharisee or a follower. You can't be both. In the natural drift to your life is to pass the exit that follows Jesus and to continue living life like a Pharisee. And we're going to see that growing in Christ means growing in self-awareness and spirit dependence. So turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to read verses 1 to 13 together. God's word says this. Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands came together, so they were trampling on one another. He began to say to his disciples first, Be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And I say to you, Anyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whatever they bring, whenever they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry how you should defend yourselves or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour 
what must be said. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, the entrance of your word brings light, gives understanding to your people. So God, would you grant us understanding and would you point us towards your son in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Jesus just got done having dinner with the Pharisees, if you were here last week, with a Pharisee, and it was not a happy dinner party. Jesus like just excoriated him, called him out um, at dinner time for, their, for his lifestyle and ultimately for his rejection of Jesus. He just got done exposing the Pharisees' heart. And now that dinner is over, Jesus leaves there and a crowd's forming. It says that there's even like thousands of them. They're kind of trampling one another. It's an unruly mob and Jesus is there. And so are some of his disciples. And the text says that he turns directly to the disciples out of all the people in the crowd. He begins to talk just to his disciples and he issues a warning right at the beginning of our passage and says, be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus warns right from the outset that his disciples need to be on their guard against the leaven that is hypocrisy. Now, in cooking, leavening agents like yeast are small. They're barely noticeable. You don't even often see them. You don't see them working. Like when you mix some dough together and you add some yeast to warm water and you add flour to, that, to it and you begin working and you sit it on the, the counter, you don't see the yeast in there, but eventually the effects of that yeast cause the dough to rise. And Jesus says that this hypocrisy that the Pharisees have is like leaven. It sneaks its way in there. And when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's not just talking about the Pharisees' leaven that exists in them. He's talking to his disciples about something that exists in us. And hypocrisy is a thing that you cannot see all the time, but it works. And Jesus warns against it. He warns against our lies being hypocritical. Hypocrisy is hard to see in ourselves, but it's really easy to see in other people. You know, when you had parents that raised you to do as I say, not as I do, right? They might have said that, or they might have told you to do one thing and acted completely different. We can see that. And if you have teenagers, teenagers can see your hypocrisy better than anyone else can. You know, and we can see it in ourselves even. You know, we, we train and tell people, like, you shouldn't text and drive, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, like, talk and drive unless you're wireless, but you know, like, you're, it's not plugged in, your phone's Bluetooth isn't working, and you find yourself breaking the very rules that you may have taught your student how to do, or you may have just complained about other people. There they are, texting on their phone, and you do the same thing. Um, we notice this in politicians, right, when they say one thing, and then something about their lives comes out. It stinks, and it leaves us questioning their credibility. One funny story kind of about hypocrisy I don't think I've shared before is there's a pastor I know of that has his kid in the back seat driving, and, you know, as a pastor, he's, like, talking about Ephesians, you know, be kind to one another and stuff like that, and um, he's driving down the road, and somebody cuts him off, and he, he yells, oh, you idiot, why did you cut me off? And his seven-year-old in the back seat goes, and there's more kind words from your pastor. And <laughs> <laughs> hypocrisy is acting and living in ways that are contrary to what you say you believe. And Jesus says that hypocrisy doesn't work, that double living does not work with him, that if we aren't aware of our own inconsistencies with who we claim to be and what we actually live, then we are in danger of becoming like the Pharisees. And the reason hypocrisy doesn't work is because God sees your inner 
darkness. He sees my inner darkness. He sees the spaces where how I claim to live and how I actually live, he sees that space between. Because we have a God who is all-knowing. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Nothing escapes his gaze. He sees you. So hypocrisy does not work because God knows what really lies within. Hebrews would say this, there's no creature is hidden from him, that is God, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him of him to whom we must give an account. Nothing is hidden from God. In our own hypocrisy, our own sins, our own failures cannot be glossed over because God sees them. He sees them. And it's real easy to want to pretend, to pretend that we're someone else so that others might like us. That does not play well with God. The other reason hypocrisy fails is because our inside, we've talked about this before, our inside always makes its way outside. Look at what Jesus says in verse two. There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Our inside makes it outside. Pharisees talked a good game, but their lives weren't actually in on the plan of God. They talked a good game publicly. They looked religious. They were the religious people, the cultural preservatives, the, the conservatives of the time. They were the good guys. But Jesus saw who they really were, and they weren't actually in on the plan of God. Jesus won't be hidden, and he won't hide what's in their hearts either, and he won't hide what's in ours. And you see what what God does when he kind of gives us this kind of thing, when he gives us this kind of warning, when Jesus gives his disciples a warning, hey, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Be on guard against it because it's something that also exists in you. When he's doing that, he's also giving us an invitation. It's not just a warning with Jesus, but he's also giving us an invitation to bring who we are before him. If he sees it, we're invited to be honest about our inconsistencies. You are giving a choice, given a choice between acknowledging who you really are and pretending to be someone you're not. And you can't pretend with God, so you may as well hear the invitation to come before him with who you really are. You see, Jesus wants your heart, and he wants to make you whole. He wants the space between how you say you live and how you actually live. He wants us to be people who are honest with ourselves. And Pharisees, as we've learned from the past two weeks, had no ability to see themselves clearly. And Jesus is inviting us to more. And friends, like the Christian life is about learning how to live Honest with ourselves and honest with who Jesus says he is. Eugene Peterson, who's one of my favorite pastors who's passed away in 2018, said this, the Christian life is the lifelong practice of attending to the details of congruence. Congruence between means and ends. Congruence between what we do and the way we do it. Congruence between what is written in Scripture and are living out what is written. Congruence between a ship and its prow, congruence between preaching and living. Congruence between the sermon and what is lived in both preacher and congregation. The congruence of the word made flesh in Jesus with what is lived in our flesh. So we kind of live as Christians in this tension, in this acknowledgement that our lives don't always line up. And the way of Jesus isn't to just stifle that part off and put a religious front forward, but the way of Jesus is to constantly bring our lives in congruent with the way he lived over and over time. So we are called 
to beware of the leaven of hypocrisy and instead tend to matters of consistency to see ourselves for who we are. And when you see yourself for who you are, it can be kind of scary. When you see yourself, man, like my religious pretending over here doesn't match up with my anger over there. That my, that my life does not match what I say. When we see those things, friends, when we see our imperfections, we're invited then to also see Christ's perfections. That Christ was perfect. That he is enough. So on the road to, of life, you will drift towards the leaven of the Pharisees. You will drift. But you, instead, there's another way you can take. You can take the exit ramp of consistency and congruence, of following Jesus and acknowledging who we are. The second kind of, for using this car imagery, drifting, the second thing that we might drift towards is fearing man or fearing God. This is the second exit. You have a choice between hypocrisy or, or congruency, or you have a choice between fearing man and fearing God. And this one is hard. Because approval and praise from others is intoxicating. And, it, and like, here's the thing. You and me, we were meant to be people who belong. We, like, God made you to belong to him. And he made you to belong to his people. And so we just have this in, innate desire that we want to fit in. We want to belong. But oftentimes, what we do is we end up replacing belonging to God with belonging to what other people think about us. We want to fit in. We want to be like. We tell this to our kids, right? You don't have to fit in. You can be you. And Jesus knows this. He knows this desire to just want to be liked by people and how this being liked by others will lead us, could lead us, to hiding him. And so he says, I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body. And after that, can do nothing more. Jesus recognizing this fear. Hey, hey, as you follow me, you're going to be tempted to live in such a way that you want to be safe around other people. And you're going to be tempted to fear them. And Jesus is also saying that the worst they can do for you is harm your body. Jesus is honest about our fears. He doesn't pretend they don't exist. He's like, I, listen, I know you're going to want to fit in. I know it's going to be hard. But listen, the worst they can do is hurt your body. So he invites them to not only see their fears honestly, but he invites them to live in a way that's free from the demands of others. It's easy to want to be liked. It's easy for this desire for acceptance to so cause us to live in such a way that we hide that we know Jesus. But this is the way of the Pharisee, not the follower. You see, Pharisees were constantly worried about what other people thought, and, so, and they constantly worried about their own image. And so this caused them to hide the truth of Jesus, to suppress it, not just within their own hearts, but within their culture. And so we are so wired in such a way that we want belonging, but instead we twist that. And, and instead of shining forth Christ and letting that be on our lips and on our tongues and on our lives, we can suppress that because we fear man. And listen, friends, fear of man Letting other people control you, what you say and what you do, when you do that, it's not really about anyone else but you. We self-protect. It's what we do in a crowd. We don't want people to see the real us, and we don't want people sometimes who are afraid of what they'll see if they see Jesus in us. And this causes compromise instead of confession. Fear of man shows up in a variety of ways in our lives, ways that we fear others more than we fear God. Ed Welch, who's a Christian counselor, wrote a well-known book called When People Are Big and God Is Small. 
Um, and in it, he gives some diagnostic questions that can help you figure out if you fear man more than you fear God. These are helpful. Here's a sampling of them. Have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Right? You ever struggled with peer pressure? Peer pressure is all about fearing man, right? Like you feel pressured to do something because of what other people think. Do you, are you overcommitted? Do you find it hard to say no when wisdom indicates that you should? You might fear people more than you fear God. Do other people make you angry or depressed? You, you say like when somebody ticks you off, they made me so mad. Well, that's letting another person determine your emotions more than God. Do you ever feel as if you might be exposed as an imposter? That someone might find out the real you? Maybe this isn't like a, like a scandalous thing, but just like you know that there are inconsistencies in your life. Well, then you're probably self-protecting. You're probably projecting an image of yourself that is different from the reality because you're afraid of man more than God. How about this? When you compare yourself with other people, do you feel good about yourself? The Pharisees did. They looked around and looked and said, hey, I tithe mint, dill, and rue. I tithe out of my spice rack. I'm doing pretty dang good spiritually. That's because they let what other people thought of them dictate who they were instead of what God said about them. Fear of man is pervasive, and it is the way of the Pharisees. It is part of the leaven of the Pharisees to fear man more than fearing God. But Jesus will replace fearing man with fearing God, and he'll say in verse 5, if you have your Bible open, but I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Kind of a startling statement by Jesus, isn't it? Right? Jesus is saying, listen, you can fear all those people, but the worst they can do to you is hurt your body. And Jesus says, listen, but God can do way more. And he is inviting us to see God for who he is. He is God. You can't hide who you are before him. He is God. He is holy. He sees. He knows And he's inviting us to have a long-term view, not just a short-term view. We often live life as if it happens in 30 seconds from now, right? Like we we don't think consequentially long-term. But Jesus is inviting us to fear God because he's inviting us to see that, listen, eternity is long. If all you're living for is right here, you're forgetting that you stand judged before God. So fear God. He can do way more. And you might hear this and be startled. Man, Jesus, this seems really mean. But here's the reality. If you're letting other people determine who you are rather than God, God is just giving you exactly what you want. You're choosing to live outside of his grace and love. He loves you and cares about you. But when you lower him, when you put him as a servant to you rather than the one that you serve, you're fearing man more than God and you're ultimately living for yourself. And here's the thing Jesus does. Jesus also says that, listen, when you fear God, when you see him as mighty and powerful and holy, you also find security there. Look at what he says. Because it's like geez, the the way the text reads, he first says, "No, fear the man who can throw your fear the one who can throw your body into hell," and then he pivots, and it almost seems to not fit. It says, "Aren't five par- sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many." 
sparrows. Doesn't seem to fit, does it? But Jesus is saying what one pastor said, that when you begin fearing God, you don't actually have to fear God anymore. Because Jesus points to the marketplace. In the marketplace, it would have sold sparrows. It would have been the cheapest thing to sell. And what Jesus says is, like, listen, when you fear God, the one who knows about the smallest item being sold in the market that no one else really cares about, when you fear God, God sees you like he sees those sparrows. And listen, God doesn't just see you like he sees those sparrows. In fact, he knows you and he is acquainted with you deeply. He knows you and loves you in such a way that he, the very hairs on your head are numbered and you are worth more than sparrows. It is when we fear God, when we put him in his proper place, that we begin to realize and find what we were looking for when we were fearing man. We find security. We find peace. We find somebody that sees exactly who we are, that sees the inner darkness, and we don't have to self-protect or pose before him, but someone that actually loves us and cares about us and has our backs. He's acquainted with the plight of worthless sparrows, and he's acquainted with you. God knows you. And when you fear God, when you're living in that light, it becomes secure. That when you are tempted to, to hide the fact that you're a Christian, because, because what if other people know? When you're tempted to do that, when you fear God, God says, listen, I know that could cost you. I know it could be hard, but I know you and you are worth more than sparrows. I got the hairs on your head counted. I have your back. Many people are clamoring to be seen, to be known for who they are, to, to not have to hide or pose anymore. But if we keep looking for other people for that satisfaction, if we keep looking for other people to other people for that approval, we will never find it. But if we come before God with who we really are, we find a God that actually sees who we are, that knows who we are more than we know ourselves, and who calls us to love him. But rarely do we let other people see the real us because we live with fear of man. We're talking to project an image that is confident and well put together. And man, churches can also do this too. We can create cultures within churches where it's a, where we create fear of man culture, where I'm afraid of what other people will think of me if they knew that I struggled with this sin or that sin. Or I'm afraid that if I let people know who I really am, that I'll be rejected. But God wants us to be a community of people who fear him more than others, who, who can live honest with God and honest before the world because of what God has done for us, because we are secure in God. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than sparrows. God sees you. So we are secure in the fact that we're known, but the other reason we're secure is because of the friendship of Jesus. If you look back up in verse four, you'll see that Jesus addresses his disciples as friends, as friends. And in the time, to be a friend of Caesar, who is emperor of Rome, right? To be a friend of Caesar meant that Caesar has your back. And you can be darn sure that if you were a friend of Caesar, you felt pretty comfortable in the world, because Caesar was a powerful guy. And Jesus is saying that you are my friend. And what he's saying is that you are secure. I have your back. To be a friend of Jesus is better than being a friend of Caesar. No matter what comes at you at life, you have more. In Jesus. No matter how difficult your life would be, Jesus has your back. No matter 
The suffering you face, the depression you deal with, the anxiety that parallels that paralyzes you, Jesus is your friend. No matter what it might cost you to be a Christian in front of others, no matter what fearing God over fearing man might cost you, Jesus has your back. You're his friend. The road to becoming a Pharisee is to live without seeing the hypocrisy within you and to live for praise and approval of others more than praise and approval from God. And that fade will eventually lead you to either denying Jesus or acknowledging Jesus. Because growing in Christ means growing in self-awareness and spirit dependence. Jesus closes this passage with some heaviness, but also some encouragement too. And he begins setting expectations. Setting expectations. He's talking to his disciples and said, listen, they're gonna drag, there's a chance that you're gonna be dragged before tribunals and authorities. Jesus is setting expectation that there's gonna be times when you're gonna wanna fear man more than fearing God. And he's setting expectations for his disciples that will actually come true in the book of Acts. They will be dragged before tribunals. They will be threatened with their lives. Some of them will even die for their faith. And Jesus is saying that you still have friendship with God and he is setting expectations for them and for us of what we can expect if we're gonna honestly follow Jesus. We're gonna be put in dip positions where it's difficult or costly to be Christians. Where loving neighbor is hard. Where we get criticized by people from all over because of the way that we live. And Jesus continues by saying that the one who confesses him still, he'll confess before others. But the one who denies him, he'll deny before the angels. If you confess him, Jesus has your back. But if you deny him, like the Pharisees did, Jesus denies you. And he pivots to some even harder sayings. He says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. That's terrifying, right? Unforgivable sin. That there is a sin that Jesus won't forgive. And what does this mean? What does it mean that there's that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is something that won't be forgiven? Because some of you, you might be wondering, man, if God, if I, does God really forgive this sin? Does he really know? Will he really forgive me? Have I gone too far? Have I sinned too much? And the answer is no. You see, you can come to God and expect to find grace, healing, and forgiveness. You can come home to him. That is the invitation. But there is a sin that God cannot forgive. And that is not accepting Jesus. That is rejecting Jesus. See, you can come to God with your sins and God will forgive you. But by not letting God forgive you of your sins, because you won't accept Jesus, well, God can't forgive that. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is final rejection of who Jesus is and what he has done. And friends, let's not forget that Jesus is still talking to the insiders, not the outsiders in the passage. You see, the slow fade of the Pharisees is that they keep not looking within. They don't go before God with the light. They reject Jesus. They fear man more than fearing God. And slowly but surely, their heart hardens and they pushed away Christ. And you might be wondering, man, I've denied Jesus. I've said things. I've done things. Will Christ forgive me? We have another um, story in the Bible where Peter, the apostle, the guy that 
Jesus literally built the church on top of. Um, he denied Jesus at Jesus' lowest time. Jesus is about to be crucified. He's been taken captive. He's getting flogged. He's being questioned. And Peter denies Jesus three times. Not once, not twice, three times. And when Jesus is crucified, after some of his disciples scatter, it's like, well, what will happen to Peter? Well, Peter gets confronted with Jesus. And he confesses, and Jesus completely restores him. Christ forgives those who come to him. And we are called to be people who are honest about the expectations that Jesus set, that it could be hard, that we're honest about our sin, that we're honest about our temptation to fear man, but where we confess Jesus, come what may, and Jesus still has our back, that when they're brought before rulers and authorities, the Holy Spirit will still give them what to say. This is hard. This is radical. But Jesus is calling us to be people who are bold in our honesty about Christ. Bold about what we believe. Come what may, because they can only hurt the body. He wants us to be people who are not like the Pharisees, who prop ourselves up on pedestals, who think that we're better than other people, but don't even see the darkness that lies within. He wants us to be people that don't let the thoughts of other people or the opinions of others control us, but let us, he wants us to be people that are controlled by the Spirit and who are emboldened by the Spirit, who live with fear of God and find all of their security and hope in Him. And man, we're going to fall at this. We're going to fail at this sometimes. But Christ still forgives, and we can still come to Him. When Paul was talking to Timothy, a young pastor, about persevering in suffering, he gave him this passage, and I love this. It says, this saying is trustworthy. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we're faithless, he is faithful. For he cannot deny himself. You get that? In all of our weaknesses... In all of our faithlessness sometimes, when we come to Jesus, he is still faithful because he can't deny himself. And he is still enough for you. So when, you, when you're stepping into life and you're like, man, I realize I'm fearing man more than fearing God. Or I realize I've not been honest with God about, who's, about what's going on in my heart. Or, or I've not been bold enough to to be a Christian in front of other people and let that cost what it cost me. When you come before Jesus, you won't find reluctance to forgive. You will find faithfulness to forgive. He is faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Mm -hmm.